who wants to re review something or a colleague couldn't make it. And now I'm going to sneeze. Or no, I'm not going to sneeze. So welcome to Angel and Accessibility. I'm Elizabeth Byatt and my colleague is Donnie Tesler. If you have any questions about accessibility, either for Angel or outside of Angel, please feel free to contact us at accessibilityweb at psu.edu. That goes to a mini list that several of us accessibility gurus review. And today, um, we're going to talk a little bit about policy and audiences and then go into which parts of ANGEL we recommend people look at um, to optimize their content for accessibility. This isn't a comprehensive seminar because that could take a while and it is still August, but um, these are kind of the main things that anyone can do that are fairly simple to do that will really make a big difference. And then, of course, we'll have more accessibility resources at the end. So. Audiences and policy. So um, the idea of accessibility is accommodating people who may um, either missing input from one of their senses or um, their mind processes things differently. Um, but also, we another kind concept we talk about is universal design, so ensuring that whatever we put up can be usable by anyone, and it's not just regardless of different senses that they may or may not have, but even if you're on an iPhone versus a regular desktop computer or you're not a native speaker of English, um, a lot of different audiences. So what we're recommending here may have been originally designed for a specific audience, but almost all of them will benefit um, more than their original audience. So the first audience a lot of people tend to focus on are people with severe visual impairments, sort of a shorthand term for that is blind, and specifically someone who um, really can't read content in any form, so they um, read content either through Braille or they use something called a screen reader which literally reads everything out. Um, a common one that we refer to is JAWS and uh, there's another one called VoiceOver. So for example, if we were on a screen reader and reading a PowerPoint, you would go through, the PowerPoint would say title, accessibility audiences, and then blind must use screen reader or braille and continue on through the slide. Um, there are also another class of people with vision impairments is called low vision. So these are people with some visual acuity. Um, legally blind is sort of a common term, but legally blind actually has some technical definition. So the better term is low vision. And the idea is you have to zoom in um, a lot. So this PowerPoint slide, you can imagine it being zoomed 200% or more. And you need to have good contrast, so that's why most of the slides are in black and white, except for this logo at the end, which is sort of decorative. <laughs> Adds a little bit of color, but if you can't see it, you're not really losing any content. Um, and the last class of visual impairments is um, people with color deficient vision or color blindness. So um, a common example of that is red versus green. So you can't rely on color coding alone. So even though my slides are using red versus green, they still work because um, this green bullet is indented and it's a different shape. So you can distinguish the two levels. So a lot of, uh, of our focus has been on that. And for those of you new to Penn State, um, in 2000, late 2010, the National Federation of the Blind um, entered into a legal action. Penn State, they specifically filed a lawsuit with the Department of Justice um, saying that there were certain of our tools that were inaccessible to the blind and we really needed to do something about it. So this is us doing something about it, basically. And then another important audience especially now that we're using more video content is deaf or hard of hearing. So this audience basically 
can't hear everything, so they need to rely on captions or transcripts. But it turns out that even though captioning videos um, is sort of, we're not going to lie, it's kind of a pain. But the benefit actually is not only are you in compliance, but it really benefits a lot of other students. It benefits those who native languages and English. Benefits students who are having trouble hearing the audio. A lot of, you know, I've been in positions where I've been asked to record a video. I'm not a video whiz, so sometimes my audio is not as good as it could be. It's also great for if you're using technical language because um, the words are spelled out on the screen, so it helps you process what um, the lecture is about. And also, if you're in the computer labs and you forgot your headphones, it's sort of like being in a bar. That's why they have closed captioning in bars, so you can figure out what the score is. <laughs> and if you do, I can answer some questions about um, if you need to caption videos, but we have also information at accessibility.psu.edu. That's our main website slash caption workflow. And then, so we've talked about a lot of sensory issues. Another huge audience um, are people with different cognitive disorders or learning disorders. They might include people with um, ADD, people with different types of reading disabilities. Um, this is actually the largest population registered with our Office of Disability Services. So as a faculty member, you may receive a request to provide certain students with extended times on quizzes or assignments or things like that. And we'll talk about how you can do that within the ANGEL environment. And then a lot of things we talk about in terms of usability and legibility are very important for this audience and actually important for all your students because sometimes when you're learning something new, you're you're a little bit behind the curve until you catch up. And just to wrap up, um, two other audiences are sometimes we talk about people with neurological impairments such as epilepsy. And so an accessibility requirement is don't flicker too quickly because you can trigger a seizure. So those of you may on the, on the news may have heard of cases of Japanese animations or there was a scene from one of the Twilight movies that was so intense and flicker, flickery that it literally triggered, triggered seizures in the movie theater. So I always say that um, this condition killed the blinking features on the web, which I personally don't miss. And finally, I want to also mention people with motion impairment. And these are people who can't use hands easily. So although you may be thinking um, Christopher Reeve who couldn't use any of his limbs, really it's your hand. So if I break a wrist, I'm temporarily motion impaired. My mother had essential tremor, so her hands would shake as she got older. Um, or Parkinson's disease, these are actually accommodations that um, have come to us. And so we emphasize keyboard access um, because it's usually easier to hit the F key than try to have the fine muscle control to move the mouse. And also, keyboard access is important for someone who can't see because, you know, they don't know where the mouse cursor is, but they might be able to find a key. So, are there any questions? Okay, I see we got more people in. That's great. So, what does this all mean for you? Well, the first thing it means is that um, because of the lawsuit, we implemented a syllabus statement and... I'm not going to point to it in the interest of, well, maybe I will. We do have some new people there. So basically, this is the syllabus statement. It's at accessibility.psu.edu slash syllabus, and your college or campus may have also told you about it. It's required for all syllabus, syllabi. Basically, it's saying we welcome students with disabilities, and if you know you need accommodations here, you should contact so. There's a list of contacts for every campus. And if at, you're at University Park, you contact Office of Disability Services. And we really strongly recommend students do this because this is how they get the accommodation letter that they might need. So if a student, like I, like I said, one of the most common requests is to extend quiz time. Um, 
I'm a skeptic as a professor, so I would want to see an official letter before I granted it. So it really is in the best interest of the students because it sets up the paperwork necessary. <clears throat> and so the question we've been getting is we're going to talk about different things like captioning videos, um, making sure images have alternative descriptions, um, certain settings on a quiz, um, other things like that. And some of them are going to be time intensive. And so the question is, when, as an instructor, do I have to do it? And what our recommendation has been is if you do receive a letter of accommodation from the Office of Disabilities, you are required to do this. And sometimes students think they can kind of muddle through and then they realize that they're going to have a trouble. And so week seven, you could get an accommodation letter and you still have to do it. So that is definitely when it's required and you can choose to wait for that. But we're also really strongly recommending that some of these easy fixes that we're going to talk about today, um, you do now. And you can do them from Angel and Word and PowerPoint. And the reason is, if you do get an accommodation request, if you've done it now, that's going to be a lot less time at midnight over the weekend that you or someone else may be doing that. And also, a lot of these will improve the experience for all students. Like I said, captioning. I was in a course, and we asked how many students use caption. None of them got a, were um, listed with the Office of Disability Services, but half the students used captioning. So that shows you how useful it is. And we'll also say that if you are teaching an online course or a hybrid course and you're working with a unit like World Campus or an instructional designer, you may be able to get help there. But um, even if you're not, you may still be responsible. The Office of Disability Services can help you with certain things. But like I said, if you want to burn less midnight oil, we strongly recommend thinking about what you can now. So we're going to be talking about which angel components are more usable or less usable, particularly for someone on a screen reader, how to add alt text to an image so you can still have your images, but just have a way for someone who can't see them to know what the content is, adding headings and subheadings. I think most of you do it, but um, there's a way to do it. You can either boldface your text and make it 16 points. and that works if you're cited, but the screen readers can't always, doesn't always identify format changes. But if you use certain tags in the HTML editor or certain styles in Word, heading one, heading two in particular, the screen readers know those are headings. Clear link text, which believe me, benefits everyone. We'll talk a little bit about tables and legibility. And the first thing we're going to talk about are alternate viewing options for, especially again, students on a screen reader. So when you are on a screen reader, um, you know, the this is sort of the main view of Angel where you have all the different icons and you have all the different tabs. And you can design that to work well enough, but um, you end up, that's a lot of links that our eyes are kind of able to kind of gaze over, but a screen reader has to kind of plow through um, one by one. So instead of that, um, some users might be on what is known as Section 508 view. That's an accessibility policy or PDA view. And the buttons are down on the lower right. And this is for the students to trigger. But if they do that, they get a much, they kind of remove some of the main navigation menu. And you'll also see that they sometimes get these mystery links such as skip breadcrumbs. So breadcrumbs are sort of the links at the top of a course that say, you know, which course and which semester you're in. And another, you can also, students can also adjust their color preferences. And if they're low vision students, they may have some fairly unique ones. So some people with low vision, you including Donnie here, <laughs> says that they really want dark background and white text or pale text. So 
and sometimes I do too <laughs> because of the glare is also another issue so um, you may sometimes see people you have a white screen and black text and they have dark screen and white text and all my links here are this strange shade of aqua and that's okay so long as you don't have hard-coded color coding in your HTML editor so kind of use that very carefully right. and these are more information I'm just gonna skip over this but these are how to's for your students our next topic is getting actually into the tools that instructors use are the angel communication tools and they've been working on improving the usability and accessibility of these tools but they're not perfect so um, for example the email tool within angel is not so good on a screen reader even though they've been working on it so as an alternative you may want to consider forwarding any angel email to the, int the user's internet, internet account excuse me so that means when you this is you're composing your email in angel there's an angel mail tool and you have an option to send a copy to internet emails recipient um, I would check that button and what that does is it makes sure it goes outside of angel into your just regular accounts so if you're on Gmail or Outlook or Apple mail you'll still get that message from email I do it anyway because you know I don't want my students saying I didn't get my e that email <laughs> I pushed it to you I'm pretty sure you did um, but in any case it's also particularly important for someone on a screen reader because their email interface may be better than whatever email tool has been given to them um, same thing with the discussion board it has some major usability issues so um, if your students are reporting problems you may want to consider a blog tool with which allows commenting it does much the same functions Yammer has been an option we've been exploring um, if you do that you may want to again encourage users on a screen reader to receive mail the only caveat there is and I actually meant to wipe out Yammer but if you do use Yammer which is another tool outside of Angel um, it sometimes has problems with screen reader too darn it <laughs> and there's also an angel chat client but you may need to use an alternate chat client such as I am or Skype so this is a discussion you can have with your students too all right, any questions all right I'm just <laughs> giving you a whole bunch of content all right the next thing we're going to talk about is the angel HTML editor so this Angel HTML editor can be found in all sorts of tools so it can be found in when you're creating quiz questions or assessment questions it can be found creating an angel page it can be found in the discussion forum and giving instructions in a Dropbox and the syllabus editor and so if you're wondering whether you should do something in Word or put it in an angel page I would recommend putting it in an angel page because they actually have very good tools in terms of accessibility that you can do what you need to do without getting too technical about it and it turns out that HTML to this day is still easier for screen readers to process there's just more support built for accessibility so sometimes you may hear accessibility advocates saying use HTML they don't mean you have to learn HTML tags they just mean you have to use something that generates uh, just a web page without uploading a document and has um, good editing tools and so what does that mean well first of all our HTML editor lets you add an alt tag and before I explain how it does it I'm going to explain what an alt tag is which is um, so for example I'm maybe I'm teaching a history course and I have this 
picture that I took from Wikipedia, so I assume it's semi-legal, and it shows George Washington at Valley Forge, so my alternative text is Washington at Valley Forge in winter snow. Um, that's pretty much the idea of an alt tag, is just showing you the basic elements of the alt tag, unless I'm in an alt history course or a course on host on clothing history or something like that, I might not go into the details about, you know, how many muskets or the red cape or the brushstrokes or anything like that. Just the part that you need for the student to understand the concept. And when you're in the Angel HTML editor, so this is sort of a short view of the WYSIWYG editor. Um, there's an insert or edit image button here and when you do that um, sometimes it comes up with an alternate text field such as um, Penn State so this is I uploaded the logo so I use the alternate text Penn State or sometimes if you are double clicking the logo to add an alt text after the fact you might hear it called short description um, don't know why the interface is different but there it is and there's several uses of the alt tag, so one is if your images don't load for some reason and you have an alt tag, you get that as a backup. So um, my other example here is if you got a, you know, your two images of Justin Timberlake didn't upload, you wouldn't know that it was supposed to be Justin Timberlake in 2001 and 2013. He's been around a while. <laughs> And just sort of to wake everyone up, there is a little bit of an art to alt tagging. So we have this little teeny picture over here. And the context is the Texas has been under six national flags um, from the 1500s until now. So we have six alternative types of alt tags. And there are two of them that I think would be useful. So I'm going to give everyone a few seconds. I'm going to read them out, and you can think. So imagine you really couldn't see that image very well. So would you want to know, wow, six flags over Texas <laughs> as your alt tag? Or would you want information image taken from Wikipedia, photo by Ann W.? Or would you want to know the file name? So 220px under slash slicks under slash flags under slash over under slash texas dot jpeg or dot jpg. So the first three. Or would you want to know four photo shows flags of Spain, U.S., Mexico, France, Republic of Texas, and Confederate flag? Or five photo of six flags. Read information below. Or finally, six, photo shows six flags of different colors waving in the breeze on a Sunday dead. Three are red, white, and blue. And I'm not going to go. <laughs> One is red and yellow. Another is red, white, and green with a little um, symbol in the middle. So any thoughts in the chat room about which two? Seven, four. Any other picks? OK. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Okay, so that's actually, so I think they're unanimously ruled out one, two, and three because they really don't provide the information you need. Um, a lot of people picked four, which probably would be a good one, especially if you didn't know what else was on the page. Um, interestingly, they've asked blind users how much detail they wanted, and they are split usually between four, and some people want six, but a lot of people recommend kind of keep it basic. 
And five you might want to use if your picture was a little bit complex and you already had a description somewhere else on the page and just point them there. So and I'll give an example of that. So here are the flags. Yay! <laughs> the, the, this one down here is France, by the way, because that's their old French flag from before the French Revolution. So here's an example of a complex image you might run into. And this one probably isn't even too bad. So this is an image of, believe it or not, there was a Swedish colony and a Dutch colony on the East Coast before the revolution. So this is the Swedish colony. And my text here talks about it being centered on the Delaware River from the head of the bay back towards Trenton. And then this is the Dutch colony, which New Amsterdam is Long Island and Manhattan. But actually, there was also New Netherlands, and it's actually stretched all the way up to Albany. So if you're going to alt tag that, and you already knew that I had written all this description down here, and I wrote it for everyone, my sighted students, I don't really need to repeat it in the alt tag. So I can just say it's a map of New Sweden and New Netherlands and read the description either before or after for more details. So this is one way you can actually use describing an image for everyone's benefit. And what do I mean by a complex alt tag? If your response is, how am I going to get this in this little tiny field? It's probably a complex image. And you might want to think about describing in other ways. I'm going to skip that time. So that's alt tagging. Um, however, another we're going to switch to one that's really, really easy to fix, and you should just fix it for everyone. And that's um, a lot of people, I guess, still remember when people didn't understand that you clicked on a link to go here. <laughs> and um, so I still see people saying, click here, or here, here, and here, my favorite, and especially on certain blogs. and. That's just not good for a number of reasons. If you're sighted, you're thinking, where is here, here, and here? Where are these three locations? Um, and if you're on a screen reader, what a lot of screen readers do, especially on a site like eLion, um, which has a lot of links on it, they might just pull, try and pull up a link to see where it goes. But if all the links on the new site are here, here, and here, that's pretty darn useless. <laughs> So you want to avoid that one. And the other issue is you might not always see it or be able to click on it. There are a lot of pages I go to where I'm supposed to download a PDF and I can't find the link and it's like buried somewhere in tiny text. So for a number of reasons, please don't do that. And also don't do things like learn more about additional international resources that might be useful. That's a little too long and not helpful. So instead, we recommend a little longer kind of hitting the sweet spot, such as you can get more information at link accessibility at, PS, at Penn State. So that kind of tells everyone where they're going or learn more from link international music links. Yes. Yeah. So this is one that benefits everyone and is pretty easy to do. And this is what Donnie was talking about. So this is a screen reader from, this is VoiceOver on the Mac, and this is a little um, utility they can pull, pull up that will link list all the links on the page. This happens to be from accessibility.psu.edu. And this is a test page, so you know, you first you see all right, accessibility table of contents, what to fix, links on a web page, and then it's like what to fix again, not great, webbing, but then all of a sudden you have click here, here, read more, read more. And then you finally get to contrast and color coding. So if that was all you kind of were seeing about the website architecture, the here, here links just aren't helping you. 
All right, so those are links. The next thing I wanted to talk about were things that we in the biz called headings. And so those are basically anytime you're thinking, oh, I'm going to blow up the text, I'm going to underline it, I'm going to make it italics or change color. But basically, it's a own line to indicate a section break um, that's a heading. And actually, headings, if you have a lot of text on a page, headings are good in general. So for example, um, and you can throw this in the chat room, um, you might not be able to see the text very well on your screen, but I bet you can tell me two people who influenced Martin Luther King. That's okay. Well, I bet you won't be surprised to find out they're Thurman and Gandhi as well as Rustin because those are the headings. <laughs> so, these actually headings are useful for sighted users because it kind of gives you a sense of structure on the page. And the same thing is true for blind users, but they use it a little bit differently. So again, what they're doing is if you're not looking for a bunch of links, you may be looking for a bunch of headings. So the more headings you have, the more you have an idea of what the structure is. So still on accessibility.psu.edu. So you know you have quick links about the site, um, general updates, the NFB agreement news, disabilities and AT, blah, 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 all the way down to multimedia tools. And so as you can see, this could be handy. But you have to do one little thing to make sure the screen reader picks it up. And that's use these formats Again, this is the HTML editor. So they have these formats called Heading 1, Heading 2, Heading 3. These are basically indicators. These are tags that the screen reader picks up and other tools pick up. The other th item that picks them up is Google. So these are actually good if you're doing a public web page and you want Google to know what's in your content. They'll also look for these heading tags. Yes. And by the way, these are also known as the actual tag for heading one is H1 and H2. So these are also sometimes known as the H tags or H1 through H6. And you can do the same thing in Word if you use heading one to heading six styles. And if you use your style tool correctly, you can modify how heading one through heading six looks so it looks the way you want it to. So you don't have to always be constantly changing the format. In PowerPoint, you also want to slide titles, ta-da, and bullet levels. So it does the same thing. So still no questions. It is Monday morning. <laughs> so um, the next topic we're going to be talking about is tables and I'm one of these people who uses tables. Tables are awesome, but um, you just have to, you can also be kind of crazy depending on how you design them. So one term I talk about is simple versus complex tables. So basically a simple table, there are no merged cells and there are no empty cells. And not only that, the rows represent one type of data, the columns represent another type of data. And all of this is just a lot easier for your screen reader to process, it's probably easier for your students to process and just everyone in general. Um, complex tables happen when you start merging cells and it's probably because the textbooks do them in order to preserve space, but in the web they're actually kind of a pain and usually not necessary, so there are ways around it. So this is a well-marked data table and it has certain features that are important. One is it, it has this caption, Windows Alt Code for Currency Symbols, that tells you what the heck this table is. Um, and again, everyone can benefit from that. And there are options for putting it at the bottom, although it's usually just as good on the top. Um, as I said, there, each row and each column has a purpose, and you've got these labels known as header headers, or it, if it's a header, it's in a table. If it's a heading, it's not in a table. Um, these are sometimes known as THs, meaning table headers. So the first row is marked as a table header in the HTML, 
and this column is also marked as a header in an HTML column. And why is that important? Well, suppose I'm reading this table and it's these arbitrary codes. So if I get to this cell and I'm cited, all right, so 0165, I can scan and I know it's in the Japanese yen road and I know it's a code number. So I kind of know that 165 means Japanese yen. But if it's in a particularly long table and um, you don't use these headings, you might just get to a cell if you're on a screen reader. It's just going to read left to right, top to bottom. So it'll just start going, hearing it'll say 0164. And you have to think, all right, was that, what row was that in? <laughs> in this case, you can go back a cell. But, you know, sometimes when you've got, you know, seven columns, it kind of gets to be a pain. So instead if it were to say, okay, you know, Generic, generic currency symbol, code number 0164, that tells you exactly what the information is right away if you're in a screen reader. So that's why these things are so important. And Angel actually has some really wonderful tools for, so when you're building a table in Angel, you can build all of this in right away. and You don't have to exit the editor or anything. So the first thing, you can do is you can add a caption and that's the title if you have more information you would want a screen reader to use you can add a summary as well and then headers these mark the little things as th so you can have the first row and if you if that's the only one you do make sure you do the first row that's probably the most important or you can do both and it's very helpful. And you might also, the width, try not to use pixels, try to use percent. So if you like zoom out, you know, a lot, um, you don't have like large words and little tiny cells. The cells sort of expand with the text. Okay. So some table troubleshooting. Give you a few minutes to think about this. There are two problems with this table. And this is sort of a typical thing I see a lot. So, hang on. Okay. All right. Mm hmm Right. Right. So that's a good thing. So you actually caught um three issues. All right, so a uh, few people identified this merge cell problem. So what this really um, happens is this, is this is sort of the title of the table. So they're trying to merge cells and change the background color. But really, this can be a caption instead. Um, a few people also pointed out that um, you don't have like a header for deity or a header for the office that that deity is occupying. And a good catch, um, another thing that can be problematic for screen readers is um, abbreviations. Um, the first time, and this is actually good practice anyway, the first time you introduce an abbreviation. So, um, so for example, I say I'm from TLT. What I really should be saying is I'm from teaching learning with technology and then in abbreviations TLT. And that way everyone knows thereafter what TLT means. And yeah, I think Donnie is about to say it, but I'll eat him to it. Yeah, it'll read tilt or Hitmull or Penn State is Sue. And you can kind of, there are things you can do to get out of it, but basically a lot of screen readers are they can cope with that's one of the things they can cope with so if you just let people know at the top what it is um, 
that's usually good enough. If you do have a student who's having problems, you might have to expand the words out. The most notorious one is sodium chloride is NaCl, and there was a chem student who for years kept hearing NACL <laughs> or things like that. So yeah, that's one thing the screen reader engines could do a better job on, but that's pretty complicated. So by the way, this is this is a fancy schmancy HTML version, but you can see you can you know you can change the you know add the headers and change the background colors, and if you're um, a real whiz, you can even add rounded corners. But um, your students don't need to have rounded corners to learn the <laughs> content. And then this is one where. This is a very, very complex table. This is the Germanic language family. So you have Proto-Germanic up here, and then it branches off into West Germanic and North Germanic, which are most of the Scandinavian languages, starting with Proto-Norse, and then East Norse, and West Norse, and so forth and so on. And then if you're on the West Germanic side, you'll learn all about English and Dutch and um, Frisian. And uh, this has been an interesting controversy. There are, I suspect um, some of you, if you're very technical, really think this table is cool and easy to understand. And if you're not so much integrated with technology, you're scratching your head. So this is an example of a table that could be clear to an instructor, but really confusing to the students. And this is also an example of sometimes you can, might need more than one. So if you had a situation, I first said, all right, this probably should be this kind of list. If you had students who say, please don't take away our table, you don't have to take away the table, but you do need to <laughs> provide a list. So um, it's like map directions. Sometimes um, some people need the map, and some people need the driving directions with the landmark. So just something to consider when you have a complicated topic. And also, it looks like a table, but the fact that you're probably going to have troubles getting it into that simple structure means it might be something like a list, which is better at um, displaying hierarchical relationships. And I tried to use color coding, but you know, it's PowerPoint. All right. And we have more information on accessifying tables. So any questions before, I think? All right. Just a little bit about color contrast. I mentioned this before. Um, you want to make sure that, you know, not too vivid. So um, this red and green isn't good, A, because some people can't distinguish red and green, and also because those of us who can are probably having a little bit of a headache because when you put bright colors together, you can get a vibrating contrast effect because um, your eyes, um, when it's bright, you sort of get an after image. And then if you get after images of different colors next to each other, it can just not work out. Um, but also, you want to watch out how subtle you are. so. I'm all about the subtle grays, but this might be a little too subtle. A darker gray might be better. And this teal, um, I see a lot on the web, but maybe a darker teal is better. And we have more suggestions on accessibility.psu.edu slash contrast. Okay. And this actually probably, if you're doing PowerPoint, is something you would really want to pay attention to. And supplementing color coding, Angel does a good job of that. So for example, if you take a quiz or an assessment, quiz was the old term for assessments. Um, depending on the answers of your question, you might get a green check or a red X. So you can get a check or an X, even if you don't see the colors. And if you are wanting to use red and green, because you know usually green is good and red is bad, in American cultures, you can try blue is good, red is bad, because more people can distinguish red and blue. That's a lot more, that's a very rare color deficiency, whereas 
10% of American men have trouble with red and green. Okay. So next I'm going to be, I have one topic and then I'm going to turn it over to Donnie for the rest and that is, um, we're going to be talking about quizzes and settings and one thing I mentioned is a very com common accommodation request is that a student might need extra time on a quiz or a drop box. So, um, or for screen readers, it might be better to present a quiz one question at a time, one question per page. It's just a little easier to process. Or you might need to do a deadline extension, and that could be for a number of situations. Someone gets sick and just needs more time. So there's a way to do this. So basically, you use the team settings. So if you, um, under the Manage tab, you'll see some tools for teams, and you can set up a team of one. So, you know, a team of missed exam or, you know, needs extension, however you want to call it. And then once you have this team set up, um, so this is, I've set up um, a quiz and then I've clicked the settings tool and then you get a number of tabs and one of them is this access tab. And you can, if you pull that up, you'll have a set of teams. You then can click on the name of the team. So I have this team alternative. And when I do that, I can create custom settings. So for example, I can, you know, I can say there's no time limit or the time limit is 120 minutes as opposed to 60 minutes. I can change the display mode to single question if necessary. You can, you know, do passwords and trackings and start dates and end dates. Most of the ones I'm doing here are your advanced settings. So that's actually a really powerful tool and not just for accessibility for a number of situations that could come up. And I'm going to turn it over to Donnie. So, so I'm going to... I'm fine, okay. but but I'm going to escape out of this and then I'm actually, we're going to, I'm going to click stop sharing so that I can monitor the chat board. Okay. All right. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have So, uh, basically, here we have a sample page of what happens when you see, uh, and by the way, I'm gone. <laughs> so, in the green, I bracketed, for go, or whatever, uh, the multiple choice, multiple select, and true for false. These are not only accessible, but they're, uh, let me talk about it. Okay, is that better for you guys? Okay, sorry about that. Um, basically, in the green brackets are the goes, multiple choice and multiple select, and true, false. Um, those are accessible, but they are also very usable. They're efficient for screen readers and for all students. Um, so then we've given you the other questions, ordering and matching, which technically can be accessible, but are really not usable. Uh, and it's very inefficient. So it's one of those you'd have to compensate by making one of those alternative teams and stuff like that. Now fill in the blanks. We let you know. Now you might want to mute your mic. Because there's an echo happening. Just one, one second. second. Uh, that's better. I am very sorry, guys. So basically, we have the yellow star there, the fill in the blank. That is very. You can. It, that's one of those where you have to be careful because it is very. It's very usable. It's very effective, and it meets some pedagogical needs, say, such as a language class or something. But it's how you write the question 
in the uh, how you write the question in the HTML editor and when you're using it. So we're, we're going to go through those options. And uh, so basically, I'm going to explain the details of each one. Now, as you can see at the bottom, I've went ahead and listed the two types of questions that use radio buttons. Um, the first one is your multiple choice. This radio button allows you to only select one answer at a time. And basically, a screen reader will read it as radio button, then A, access to a disability parking space for the computer lab, select radio button. So it's very usable friendly for a screen reader because it reads it beginning and at the end and allows you to select it. So it tells you what kind of uh, selecting tool it is lets you understand what the content is and then select it. And if that's not the correct answer to the first question to that question, they can keep going on to the next one. Um, now just to let you know, when a person uses a screen reader, they are going to be navigating with an arrow button. So it, it gives you no other choice. They can go ahead and navigate by um, tabbing through it, but that only links them to all the selections, so it goes to each radio button or reach each choice. Um, also, I've given you an example here with that number seven question, define accessibility. I've shown you what, what tools you can use by increasing the font size for making it more accessible for those low vision uh, users. Um, now, the bottom one there, number 15, is a true-false question, one or the other. It, it, the radio button is highly usable there. And we've given you a link there for the angel quizzes just so that you can understand those more. So here's the multiple select question. It is also uses the radio button. But the only difference here is the one issue is it, you can select as many as you want. The whole problem is with a screen reader, how is that person going to know they can have multiple items to select? So here's the only issue is these checkboxes need to be told that they can select them. So in the question, you want to put check all that apply. This is beneficial for both students because they might not actually think about the little square is a checkbox versus a circle radio button. But to a screen reader, it is read as a radio button. So they don't understand that they have the choice to select all of them. And in this case, the question example, every question is correct. So imagine if you were a blind student and you heard the first one, learning disorders. Basically, you'd say, oh, question's correct. And then maybe you would tab to the next question and back up to the question to be more efficient if you were under a time crunch. Well, now they know there are multiple selections, so they can go through and select each one that's correct and move on to the next question. Um, any questions about radio buttons before I move on to... Uh, combo box pop-up buttons. <laughs> okay, um, here these are accessible, which means that a screen re someone using a screen reader can access them, um, but they're not very usable because uh, basically what happens is those little air you have those little up and down arrows. It opens up a population box, but when it's read, it reads combo pop-up box. Then you can select it. Then you have to hit and hit enter. Then it says an empty void space. Then you toggle the arrow down, and it goes to selection A or selection 1, 2, 3. And they have to toggle through. Then select one. And then it reads the question. And then it skips to the next question combo box. So unlike the radio button, it doesn't give you the choice to reevaluate what you assess there. So it, it can be kind of uh, uh, problematic there. So uh, we go ahead and show you in the next slide that how, how much, if you use this in the matching question, which is the option it is, this becomes even more of a cognitive challenge just for someone who's just listening to this. So basically, you read the question, then you have all this tabular data, uh, and you have to use your short-term memory to associate A is public dialogue, B is euphemism and so on, and then you have to go through and choose the combo pop-up pop box. Now here's the other issue with the combo pop-up box, sorry. Um, 
you can select them you can select a for all of them so basically there's nothing so if uh, the student forgets on the first combo box pop-up box it's a they can select a and misunderstand it so um like uh, basically there's public dialogue and then insta and open dialogue so those have a bit of a general same meaning but they can be confusing and they can mix them up so that's why i purposely use that one um you can try we we've tried still the idea of sh shortening it to maybe three choices or two choices but still the actual use of the combo box pop-up menu is kind of complicated and challenging for them to navigate. And uh, with ordering, you use it here also. So we purposely here used a, a, a really badly typed question. Imagine it's 11 o'clock at night, you're typing it up, trying to get this quiz out. Um, so bravo, alpha Charlie. Uh, a sighted person would look and they would open up a pop-up box and they'd say, oh, they want me to put it in order and associate it by alphabetical. The problem is, if it's a screen reader, what it does in ordering is it populates a number for the pombo, combo pop-up box and then it gives you an ABC ordering function before the actual answer. So basically, it's adding more confusion to it for someone who's reading. So they're going to hear uh, combo pop up box select. Then if they enter, it's one, two, three, or null. Then they have to select it to exit it. And then it reads the next line. And they have to actually read through all of the choices, then try and arrow back, ta you know, clicking away to try and get back to the first combo pop up box and then answer it and try and remember. Now, a lot of ordering questions aren't one word. They might be a sentence or imagine a science test, you know, uh, the development of uh, the growth, uh, the splitting of a bacteria or you have uh, the order of genetics. It, it can get quite, quite confusing. So we've reworded the question to go ahead and try and de defeat that issue. Um, so if you give, if you're given three Air Force codes, such as Charlie, Alpha, and Bravo, um, you'll alphabetize it, and you'll want to give them a corresponding numerical value. This explains the task, gives the orders, and so on, but we kind of are, really don't recommend it because it's still not user-friendly or efficient because of those combo pop-up boxes. Hard for them to navigate, move through, and select, and stuff. And here's something that someone else had told us. Imagine needing to print this test out. Um, it, you know, it, it works to go ahead and do it here, but under, with a multiple choice question, it doesn't work very well because, uh, I mean, the ordering question, it doesn't work very well either. Um, so if we go to the next slide, uh, you can see how turning it into a multiple choice alternative is actually more cognitively challenged, but actually give some order to it. So you can see the worst version and then a more usable multiple choice version. And here's the benefit for, uh, uh, for any teacher. You can go ahead and print it out now without any problem. It suddenly becomes a bubble in question test. And every time you pick up, uh, try and open up a a preview of it, it'll reorder, it can reorder the questions and so on. So basically you can make a multiple choice bubble in question uh, with ease. So here you go, it explains how to do it and then it gives you a list of all of them and actually giving you five choices that they have to cognitively discern from and then you have instead of only three choices. So we come to fill in the blank, the one where we just have to be a little bit more cautious about what we do. Uh, here's the issues. Um, it re you you will t they'll use the arrow and read through the line. Students with disabilities should start and blank fill in with teachers at the beginning of the course. That is how a screen reader will read that question. So if they try and go back 
it goes word by word by word, which isn't very efficient and time effective or very helpful. So um, th this can be actually very difficult for a screen reader. However, those who are cited can go ahead and say, oh, okay, this is great. Uh, fill it in and no problems. Um, so that's kind of the resolution that we've come up is based on how you write the question using your HTML editor. So here we write it and uh, we give you two options. And uh, this also gives you the option to put in a word bank before this. So if uh, you know it's a language class, you want to give a word bank to help the students uh, recall or make sure that they know how to use it. You're going to type in the question and put in blank number one for where the blank would be. And then you would put that fill in the box at the end for the screen reader. Now, uh, the students who are cited will have no problems understanding it and they will see it. Uh, the other option, um, but we recommend this to keep it down to maybe probably three questions at a time uh, or three sentences as we have here, uh, is to put all the fill in the blanks at the end and label them with those appropriate blanks. Um, so then if the next slide we go ahead and show you uh, how it's written in the code. Uh, because it's a, it's a special way to go ahead and write it. And then you can hi use the bold to highlight the blank in the HTML editor, and it won't interfere with the screen reader. But it will help emphasize it for those with low vision or just regular students who are reading. And they can go ahead and discern where to fill in the blanks. Um, but this is a helpful guide if you need it, in the, if you want to go ahead and use this type of quiz option. Now, our final one, uh, the games. We all try, want to try and make it a little bit more entertaining or try a different way to get students to interact with a quiz for fun. We have crossword puzzles and uh, a quiz show, something, uh, what is it, like Jeopardy. Not accessible at all to screen readers at this time. Uh, it uses a uh, computer-generated uh, coding called Flash. And unfortunately, at this time, we uh, Angel Learning Management System has not made it accessible. They haven't written the code for it. So we recommend that you don't use the game options at all. But if you do, then you will have to make a second quiz or a second option and develop that secondary access menu. So the whole thing is, the idea is work once and write out a quiz that's usable for all of you and just deal it with once and eliminate the problems which gives you the idea of what we call universal design, and it'll save you time in the future or save you having to deal with required accommodation codes and so on. And I will pass it on to Dr. Pyatt, and she will wrap things up. All right, so unmuting my microphone. Uh, I just did one comment. Um, if you do want to, especially like of the quiz show, especially in a face-to-face -face class, you can do things like um, PowerPoint. You may be able to there do some quiz type show activities there. Online, uh, you can actually probably do PowerPoint in the form of a quiz or something like that. It just doesn't and you can act and upload images if you alt tag them. So, uh, so to quickly wrap up, um, there are two places to learn more about accessibility. One is the ITS knowledge base, which is kb.its.psu.edu. kb.its.psu.edu. If you search for angel accessibility, there are a number of articles that will come up. Um, for specific situations, and of course, accessibility.psu.edu. I do want to talk about files and links really quickly. Um, we've actually heard complaints about Angel not being accessible, and it turns out that people are uploading files and videos that aren't accessible. So there are techniques for making Microsoft Word and PowerPoint accessible. Unfortunately, I think uh, we might be overlapping with the Microsoft Word um, accessibility, but I'm pretty sure training will run that again, and we do have 
information accessibility .psu .edu slash tools. Um, as Donnie mentioned, um, Flash is difficult to accessify, meaning if it's not already accessible, unless you know ActionScript, <laughs> you're going to have a hard time making Flash accessible. And same thing with PDF. We really recommend you have Word and PowerPoint as a backup. And then, oops, there are other tools. Um, the other thing, I'll go back in here. Um, we're trying to document tools such as um, blogs that, uh, blog tools, um, other communication tools that are available at Penn State. Um, a lot of them have some baseline accessibility built in, but there are always some quirks. So depending on how you're doing it, you may um, need to adjust to how you do things because, yeah, there's still kind of this catch-up thing where, you know, crosswords are a great activity, but unless, but if you have someone who can't use them, then you're kind of, having a problem. So anyway, we are at the end. So are there questions? Sure. And And we can also have these slides sent out to everyone. Yeah, and in fact, we're probably going to upload them onto the accessibility website on the Angel page. <laughs> well, we're hoping that this is all helpful for you guys and, uh, and actually saves you time in the future. Yeah. So, any other questions or comments? And just one final comment was, I know we threw out a lot of information at you today. Please don't panic. It's sort of, a lot of people kind of go through that stage, but try and breathe and work through it. And also think about triaging. So we talked about alt tagging. Well, maybe you have, all your courses have lots and lots of images. So what we probably would recommend is the next time you are developing your course, think about adding alt tags and think about your gen ed courses first and then worry more, be more about your 400 courses later. <laughs> and I've been there myself and uh, once you get into the habit, it's not so bad, but you know, learning some new tricks is, you know, sometimes more work than you may think you want to do, but it really does pay off in the end. All right. Well, thank you for coming on Monday morning. <laughs> All right. We'll be here for a few minutes. If there are any more questions. More thank yous from Annette and Terry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. And, uh, we'll be hanging out for a little bit to help you if you need any questions. Yeah. Or we can show you a slide. All right. Yeah, and our events include, uh, Donnie will be running the Angel session again in October, and it'll be live. It'll so be live. In person. So you can, <laughs> you can get up close and personal. Um, I think we'll also be running things on EPUB, which is pretty new, and like I said, the STEM accessibility, and hopefully, I have to find out, I think the training will probably be running some sessions on Microsoft Office. Yeah. 
this is accessibility.psu.edu. This is home in ah, that was not what I wanted to do. There we go. So basically, we update this all the time with different classes and stuff throughout the year and so on. Um, so also, we post them on the Yammer. Uh, feel free to follow follow accessibility at PSU and join a group and so on. And, uh, keep up to date with all the changes and stuff and the new technologies. If uh, we'll talk about accessibility with the different technologies and so on. Yes, and we also make house calls. So if your department is interested in hearing from us, we can definitely come visit. And uh, oh, our other topic is escape from PDF, as we're saying. Uh, PDF, um, we're not expecting to eliminate all PDFs, but if we can kind of reduce the number vastly, our job will be a lot easier. Okay. So if you guys are, we're all done here for now, so feel free to um, log off, but if you have any further questions, we will be here for another five or ten minutes. Uh, so thank you very much for attending. I'm going to stop recording now.